Hey everybody, here is our review for chapter one, some additional practice. Um, our first part will be finding the length of any of the missing sides of the triangle. So that is the review of our Pythagorean theorem. So at the top, here we go. And just remember that when you have a right triangle, this is the only way this works, that A and B make up the two sides that form the right angle and then C is what we call the hypotenuse. So what I like to do is when I'm placing the numbers into the formula of A squared plus B squared equals C squared, I like to make sure that I get C in there first. So what I mean by that is like on number one, X is the diagonal. So that's what I would put here. And then I can put five squared and seven squared. And I could also do seven squared and five squared in any order. So anyway, as I do this, all right, had to take a little pause there, but anyway, five squared is 25, seven squared is 49. When I add those up, I end up getting 74, and that equals the hypotenuse squared. So I just want x, I don't want x squared. So to undo a squared, we will square root the right side, which cancels out the square, which means I'll square root 74. And then as far as your answers go, you can leave it like this. The square root is 74. You could also use your calculator if you want, take the square root of it, and it's about 8.60. All right, next one. So again, making sure that I put everything in the correct spot. So if it's a squared plus b squared equals c squared, my diagonal is the seven. So this time I'll put seven squared in here. And then the three and x can just be in either spot of a squared or b squared. So now when I square my numbers, my job will to be to get the b squared alone. So I subtract the 40, I'm sorry, the nine from both sides. That leaves me with 40. And then I'll take the square root of both sides so I can get to just b. And again, you can leave it as the square root of 40. You could also give me the decimal. And either of these is fine. What would be better, and what I would prefer to at least try, is even though 40 doesn't have a perfect square root, it has factors that do. And then I could take the square root of 4 and turn it into 10, 2 with the square root of 10. So that's the preferred answer, but you can give me any of the things that are circled. All right, on this one, finding the missing side length. So this is 2. And when I count across the bottom, I have 8. And here is my hypotenuse. This is the C. So 2 squared and 8 squared is C squared. I'm going to square my numbers really quick. Then I can add those up. And so when I'm ready to solve for C, I will take the square root of both sides. And again, you can leave your answer as the square root of 68. You can find the decimal of it. And those are both great answers. I'll take those. But if you can think of the factors of 68, you will see that you can break 68 down into 4 and 17. And then I could take the square root of 4 and turn it with 2 with the square root of 17. So again, the black answer is preferred, but I'll take either. All right, this one we've got 4 and 7. This time we're here's our hypotenuse, so we can drop those numbers into A and B. Squaring my numbers. Adding them up. And now to solve for C, I'll square root both sides. And as far as answers goes, the square root of 65 is great. The decimal of it is also fine. And there are no factors of 65 that have a perfect square root, so these would be the two answers I'm looking for. All right, a linear equation is defined as y equals 3x minus 4. We're going to write an equation that's parallel to it going through this point. And if you guys notice, this point is actually the y-intercept. The y-intercept is when all the x values equal 0. So I can actually just place this into y equals mx plus b. And when I do that, my slope will be parallel. So if the original slope 
is 3, then my new slope will still be 3, and then I can just put that into y equals 3x with my y-intercept of 2. When I do this as perpendicular, then th when the slope is 3, that's the same as 3 over 1, which is just going to change into negative 1 third. So y equals negative 1 third x, and now my y-intercept is negative 3. So I'll put minus 3. And then we're going to graph all three lines. So let's start with the original one, I'll put this in red. So I begin at negative four, that's the number that's by itself. So over here, y-intercept of negative four. And then I'm gonna get some more points by doing my up three over one. And I'm just gonna make sure I graph uphill. So I'm gonna put all these on here and try to connect them straight. All right, the parallel one, I'm gonna put that in green. So this time I have a y-intercept of two, but the same slope of up three over one going uphill. So those lines should be parallel, not touching. And then in the last one, I will graph the perpendicular. So this time my y-intercept is negative three down here. And my slope is up one over three going downhill. So up one, one, two, one, two, three. So I'm just muttering to myself. All right. And what should be forming then are right angles here and here. All right, let's move on to the next page. So we're going to find the equation of the graph provided and then draw a line parallel and write the equation and draw a line that's perpendicular, write the equation. So when I need to find the equation, they actually want us to just put it right here. Um, I will find the y-intercept, which is, if you look really closely, that's six, and then my slope, so this point will let me to see that I'm gonna rise one and run one, two, three, four, five. And it's gonna be negative because the line is going downhill. So I can take that and here's the equation. So y equals negative one-fifth x plus six. Now draw a line parallel and write the equation. So I'm gonna keep the same slope again and this time I'm just gonna drop it down a little bit. Maybe I'll make my y-intercept two instead, but you can choose whatever you want here. So here goes my two, then up one over five. I'm just gonna get my, as many points as I can. So now I have a line that's parallel. And then I'll do one that's perpendicular. So this time our slope will switch to a positive five over one, which I could then just turn into 5x. And let's do a y-intercept of, let's do one at the bottom. So let's change it to minus six. So here's a negative six, and I'm gonna go up five over one, up five over one, and I think that's pretty good. So again, what should be happening is I should see some right angles forming here. All right, given the following table. So this is where maybe you wanna get out your yellow packet and on the back of the lighter yellow shade, we know, I gave you guys the formula, it looks like this. And we're gonna write the equation right here for this table. So the first thing I need to do is realize what my slope is and the fact that this is always going up by two in algebra one that started as your constant difference but it eventually moved into your slope. And then I just need to pick some point to use. So you can use any point you want. You could use the y-intercept and be done with it. You could just be like, well, it's y equals uh, a slope of two, so two x plus my y-intercept. Maybe you don't realize that and you wanna use a different point, so I could also use, let's 
Sorry, I'm trying to switch colors here. All right, so let's say we decide to use this point instead, 218. So then what I would do is I would take 2 as my x coordinate, 18 is my y coordinate, and I'll put them in the spots right here. So y equals the y value of 18. The slope is going up by 2, so plus 2 with x minus then the x coordinate. So I'll put 2 in here. And then to get it to look like y equals mx plus b, I will distribute. And then I will combine my like terms. So 18 take away 4 is 14. And then I would get the same answer either way. So I guess it's just what you notice. Oh, well, and then it did say has a y-intercept of 11. So, oh, so I take that back. So all of that work actually goes up here. So when I'm done, I'm not paying attention, goes here. That's the equation for the line. All right, so with that, I'm going to put my work for the next one here. So here they tell me that I have a y-intercept of 11, which means I can just go straight into y equals mx plus b as long as the line is parallel to this one. So I'll have y equals 2x and a y-intercept of 11. And then one that's perpendicular, but this time has a y-intercept of negative 20. So there's my b. And perpendicular means my slope is now going to be a negative and one half. So y equals negative one half x minus 20. Uh, what's the definition of a regular polygon? So you could look at the golden page, but a regular polygon is just a two dimensional figure with line segments that connect to make, um, I think it said an enclosed figure. All right, number nine, we're gonna talk about here, but then I'm gonna add like an extra question at the end. So just know I'll be jumping back to here. So this is also a good time to use that gold page that you got in the last class. So we will be working specifically here with regular polygons. So that means in this polygon definition, all the sides are congruent and all the angles are congruent. So a pentagon has five sides, an octagon is eight sides, and then we will figure out this one in just a moment. But we'll walk through the first two. So the first thing I need to know is how many lines of symmetry on there. So if you look at your gold page, there is a column that just tells you how to find the lines of symmetry and how many lines of symmetry there actually are. So as long as it's a regular polygon, the number of lines of symmetry is the same as the number of sides. So that would then happen with an octagon. Now, where they are, that, that differs. So I'm actually going to come down to number 10 and just remind you what that gold page is saying. So if I do have a pentagon, which I'm not a very good shape, but something like this, and then I have an octagon, this is an odd number of sides. This is an even number of sides. So let's start with the even. To actually find all the lines of symmetry, I go from one diagonal to the opposite diagonal, and that would give me one, two, three. Well, you know what? That wasn't an octagon. I drew a hexagon, so let's fix that. Let's change this. Hold on. Let me draw an octagon. Hold on. So one, two, Three, <laughs> hold on, I'm gonna pause and draw this. Okay, I'm back, so as it turns out, I'm really bad at drawing an octagon, so I just found one and posted it here. So if you do have to find the lines of symmetry, what your gold page tells you that if it's an odd amount of sides, like a five-sided figure, a seven-sided figure, a triangle, 
a nine-sided figure. Then to find the lines of symmetry, you will go from the vertex, that's a corner, to the midpoint, the middle of the side opposite of it. So there's one. So here to the middle of the side opposite, from here to the middle of the side opposite, and from here to the middle of the side opposite. Okay, and one more. And as I did that, I got five of these lines. If we recount them, there's one, two, three, four, well, kind of four, five. Now, if you have an eight number, eight sided figure, so even numbers, four, six, eight, then it's a little different. It's going to be from corner to corner. So there's one, two, three, four. So that's vertex to opposite vertex, corner to opposite vertex. And then you'll get four more by doing midpoint to opposite midpoint. Midpoint just the middle of the side. So there's one, two, three, four. So that would give us four more for a total of eight. All right. All right, we'll still finish this blue part. So what is the smallest degree of rotational symmetry? So that means if I just take my shape and I start to turn it like a, a knob, a dial, how many degrees would I turn it so that the shape is the same as it was before? So what we did is then we decided to draw on all these triangles. So an eight-sided figure would involve eight triangles. And the 360 degrees that makes up a circle is broken up evenly into these corners of the triangle. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I have eight angles that are all the same amount because all these triangles are congruent. They're the same. And those eight angles are then split up 360 degrees. So all I have to do to answer this question is take 360 divided by 8, and we get 45 degrees. So with the one above, I would take 360 divided by 5, because it's a five-sided figure, and then I get 72 degrees. So in this one, I'm trying to figure out, I'm going to put it down here, 360 divided by however many number of sides gives me 40. So to do that, you could set it up as a proportion. And you could do this crisscross multiplying. So 360 times 1 is 360. 40 times n is 40n. And then divide by 40, and you'll see that it's going to be a nine-sided figure, which means it has nine lines of symmetry. All right, so um, choose one of the three regular polygons from the table above and list out every angle that rotates it. So I'm going to choose the octagon. And not only is it 45 degrees, but all multiples of 40, or, so multiples of 45. So I'm just going to keep adding 45 until I get to 360. And so I should have eight numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, which one did I leave out? I left out the 270. <laughs> eight. All right. Translations, or I'm sorry, transformations. All right. Translations, pretty simple. We didn't do a lot of those, but this means take my shell, uh, shape, go left two and up five. And be sure to label your image appropriately. You would lose points if you didn't do this. So every point's going to go left two, up five. So here's my new J. My new I, left two, up five. And my new H, left two, up five. Connect them. You are expected to connect them. And I should have symmetrical if I was using a ruler. All right, let's take 13 next. We'll save um, the tougher ones for last. So we're going to reflect this across the line y equals x, which is the same as y equals 1x plus 0. So a y-intercept is 0, and it's going to go across this 
line that's going to reflect across it. So if you look at your golden page, or the yellow pages, I'm sorry, what we would want to do is find the slope of the line of reflection, which, which we know. We know it's 1, up 1 over 1. So what I'll do is I will just follow um, that slope but going the opposite direction. So we're going to change it to negative 1 over 1. So I just know, that, for instance, that I is going to have to make it over here somewhere. I'm not putting it in the right spot exactly here, but I'm going to count how many times does it take me to move I. So I go, there's 1 up 1 over 1, there's 2 and a half. So now I'm going to do two and a half on the other side. So one, two, and a half. So this is where my new I ends up. I'm going to repeat that with J. Let's use a different color for J. So J, or sorry, G, I'm going to go up. There's one. So I'm just going to repeat that. That's where my new G is. Oh, I'm getting, all right. And then H. So H, you know, I just actually just have to go a half, which means I'm just going to do a half the other way, right? And there's going to be my H. So let me outline this in black. So it's going to go, um, here's I, G, H, back to I. And now I have a mirror image. Uh, let's keep doing the easier ones. So on PQR, so 15, I'm going to identify the slope, which is still 1 over 1. I'm going to take that the other way now, and let's start with P. So P, I'm going to go 1, 2, 3, and a half. Now I'm going to continue 3 and a half. So 1, 2, 3, and a half. So this is where my new P is. And I'm going to do R. So R goes 1 and a half. So here's 1 and a half. And then Q will go 1, 2, 3. So I'm going to repeat that with 1, 2, 3. So I'm doing all of these without any tools, patty paper, or compasses. But on the test, you can use whatever you need. So connecting, connecting, connecting. And again, notice I'm labeling my new points, and I'm putting them with the apostrophes. All right, the next one, I will be going left 4. And the other one means down 4. So left 4, down 4. It's my new H. So here goes I, left 4, down 4. And then J will go left 4, down 4. All right. OK, let's do the 90 degrees. So what did not make it on here, just so you guys know, is a 180. You might want to practice that. You've got lots of things to practice. Um, we're going to rotate this shape clockwise about the origin. So there's the origin, 0, 0. Clockwise means we're going to be turning to the right. And so uh, I'm going to draw in the patty paper, but then I'll be erasing it. So when I take my patty paper, I either need for it to line up so that the corner is here and that it lies like this. That's one option. Or here's the patty paper and it goes like this. So where do I set the patty paper? The patty paper, since I'm going to go clockwise, when I move K clockwise, it wants to cross over the patty paper. So clockwise would be this way. So that is how I want to keep my patty paper placed. So I'm going to get rid of the orange one. I'm going to get rid of that little swirl. And now I'm going to find the slope. We're going to call this P from P to K. And I don't go up or down, but I do go left 3. So now k, it's going to switch to 3 over 0, which and I'm going to go this way. So I will go up 3 from p, and then I will not go up or down. So p ends up being right there. 
I'm sorry, K. All right, so I'm going to erase that. I'm going to erase that, erase that. All right, there's my new K. Let's check out J. So first, my slope from P, J is up to 1, 2, 3, 4. So it's a rise to run 4. So I'm going to switch it to 4 over 2. And I'm just going to remember that I'm going to take my patty paper. Um, let's do the patty paper like this. And it's going to rest its corner here. And then its side is going to rest along J like this. So I'll make it a little bit bigger. Because I want to set it on this side as opposed to the other side so that when J moves clockwise, it's crossing the patty paper. So that means I know my new side is going to have to be somewhere. My new side, my new point will have to be here. So from P, I need to go up four, one, two, three, four, and then I'll go over two, and my new J, one, two, three, four, will end up right there. Okay, I'm going to erase these little tools here. All right, last one is L. So again, I'm going to take my patty paper. It's got to run its corner here and run alongside here. So it's going to go something like this. And I'll find my slope of P L, which is up four over two. So I'm switching it to two over four. So that means I need to go, all right, so from P, I'm going to go up two, and then to the left, four, one, two, three, four, and my new L, sorry, I'm getting confused with all the letters here, will end up here. All right, erasing these things that I don't know. So my new shape, I'm going to outline in black now. and that's 90 degrees clockwise. All right, the next one is going to be 90 degrees counterclockwise around the point um, negative 1, negative 1, so right there. And I'm going to do the same thing. So this time it's counterclockwise. Everything's going to turn to the left like that. And we'll call that P one more time. And so from um, P to A, I'm going to go up one, two, three, four, one, two, three. So I'm going to switch it to three over four. And since it's going counterclockwise, when we think about how we want that patty paper to look, I'm going to want it so that, let's use green here, it goes like this. So again, the corner is on, whoops, messed that up. Hold on. The corner is on P and runs along A like this. I'm not very good at drawing a square either. Or I want it to be P and runs along A. So let, me, let me make it go like this. Sorry. Sorry, I can't use patty paper on this. All right, so if it has to go counterclockwise and A has to move, um, counterclockwise with A goes this direction. So I actually want to keep the green square and not the red square. The other red square would use um, clockwise. So I'm going to go up three and over four. And remember, I didn't draw the square very good, so up three over four, one, two, three. I actually did a pretty good job. And there's my new A. And then I'm just going to do the same thing with B. And the nice thing about B is my patty paper is kind of already lying in the right spot that I need it to. So from P to B, we're going to go up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five. Was that five? Okay, so I'm going to switch it to 5 over 8. So from P, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to go up 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and over 8 to the left. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And notice it's always right on the edge of the patty paper. Okay, let's erase what we don't need. Don't need this, that, and my new AB is, oh, let's use black. 
right here. And here's my new B. I need to label that. Okay, let's see what else there might be. Otherwise, I'm going to add my own question at the end. Okay, so this didn't make it on here, but I need for you guys to think about this. I want to know um, how many lines of reflexive symmetry would this have, right? So that I could prove, for instance, actually, let me repeat that. So I want to prove that, for instance, angle B is congruent to angle E. So how could I do that? Well, there's a couple of ways of how I could do that. One is I could draw in this line of reflexive symmetry because now B is a mirror image of E. Okay, so how do I prove, for instance, that angle B is congruent to angle E? Well, I could draw a line of reflexive symmetry and B would go where E was and E would go where B is. So that's one way I could prove that B and E are the same. Okay? What about rotational symmetry? So if it was rotational symmetry, let me do a little racing here. Then how would I prove that? Well, for instance, I would draw in my center and I would realize that if I drew these triangles in, I could start to rotate, turn right around here. And so I could take that 360 divided by 5, which if you remember, we did that on problem, let me take a look, um, number 9. And I could turn it every 72 degrees, either clockwise or counterclockwise. So when I turn it the first time, E isn't here, it moves here. And then when I turn it another 72 degrees, then E moves to here. And then the same would happen if I did my B and C, my B. So I could move B here. And then I can move it here. And then eventually get to here. So I could also use rotational symmetry of 72 degrees to show that eventually B can become E. And the same idea could then happen with my side length. So let's not look at angles now. So if I wanted to prove, for instance, that ED was congruent to BC, and they'd write it like this. So prove ED is congruent to segment BC. Well, again, I could just do that line of symmetry down the middle, here for instance, and then um, mirror images ED is now a mirror image of BC. So I could use my line of reflective symmetry, reflexive I should say, Okay, and then if I were to do rotational symmetry, the same thing would happen. I could start rotating it and eventually BC in one rotation would end up here, so that's 72 degrees, and then another rotation end up here, so 72 and then another 72, I could rotate this with 144 degrees, and then BC would be congruent to ED. So just a little bit more clarification there. And that's it. That is your review. This entire thing, including this extra pit bit, uh, is brought to class on Wednesday. No excuses. I will not accept it late.